This is Lessons in Leadership. I'm Steve Adubato. If you're catching us for the first time on radio on AM 970 or a podcast or on the video side, this is a show all about leadership, everything you wanted or needed to know about leadership. That's what we do. Together with my colleague and co-host, Mary Gamba. How are we doing, Mary? We're doing great. Doing great. Where are we telling folks we're coming from? We are coming from beautiful East Main Media Studios. In beautiful where? Little Falls, New Jersey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great studio, great operation. Thank you yeah. to Brian Brodeur and his team. Mary, before we go to our colleague and friend, Greg Lalavie, let folks know where they can find us other than listening to us right now. Absolutely. So for those listening on radio, when you're in a safe place, if you're driving, you can look us up on Facebook at Steve Adubato, PhD, that's A-D-U-B-A-T-O, as well as on Twitter at Steve Adubato. You can subscribe to the podcast to hear our previous episodes, and you can do that on Apple Podcasts as well as on Google Play. And as always, we have a ton of great resources on our website, which is stand-deliver.com. Also, by the way, you can go on the AM970 app and find us there as well. And again, the reason we're on video is because we're looking forward to having folks see what we do as well as hear it. Let's introduce our good friend Greg Lalavie, who is in fact the uh, business manager, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825. Good to see you, Greg. Good to see you. Thanks for having me. We talk about leadership all the time. We'll get into a lot of the details about your view and your philosophy of leadership and also how you've evolved as a leader. But real quick... Tell folks what the organization is. We are 7,400 men and women. We primarily operate heavy equipment on construction sites. So we'll build your roads, your bridges, your buildings. We also work in mines around the state. We also work for companies that are dealers of equipment and we do the product support and the repair of the equipment. You grew up in this union. I did. Followed my father into it. And your brother's in it. Both my brothers are in it. And I have a cousin who's in it. It's in your blood. Yes. So it's interesting. I often say fully disclose when there are relationships you may not know about, but for a long time I've been doing leadership coaching, if you will. We have a leadership academy at Local 825 that we've been doing that Greg is actively involved in. Our company provides that work for them, and they're also one of our big supporters on public broadcasting of our work. But Greg, you introduced this book to me. You look around here, you see all these leadership books, and they're not props. They're props, but they're books that we've read, not all of it, but We've read a lot of it, and they've influenced us, and that's why we incorporate them into a conversation. But Greg talked to me about this book about, I don't know, four months ago, Extreme Ownership. He'll set it up for us, and now it is required reading, not just in the leadership work we do at your organization, but we've now stolen it, and we're forcing everybody else to read mm -hmm. it. Awesome. Great book. Extreme it's Ownership, fun. How Navy, oh, yeah, yeah. U.S. Navy SEALs Lead and Win. Set it up for us. So this book is written by a couple of Navy SEALs, and they just talk about what their leadership philosophy is and how they ran their unit when they were in Iraq. And when they talk about extreme ownership, they start right out at the beginning and talk about there being no excuses or not pointing any fingers. And in no matter what the situation is or whatever may have gone wrong, if something went wrong, that each of us has a responsibility to look inside and figure out what they may have done differently. So for instance, I just did something with my staff at work and I wasn't getting back what I thought I expected from them all. And I realized that I communicated poorly in what it is I wanted as a finished product. So I own that piece of How'd it. How'd you own it? I just told the guys when they asked me, is this what you wanted? When I said no, but that's not on you, that's on me. I communicated what I wanted poorly. That's hard to say, though. I'm impressed. I mean, that's a really hard leadership quality to be able to say and admit that it was not you, it's me. And I'll complicate it even more. Some of your folks have told me that that is somewhat different in you. What they mean is they've seen you evolve as a leader and your ability to own it and say, yeah, my bad, really quick no excuses, that that's not totally brand new, but you've evolved into that. Is that fair? It's very fair. But to take it from the book, one of the authors speaks about an operation that went completely wrong. In Iraq? Yes. So his senior leaders came and he had to take a look at what went wrong, break it down. And he could have laid it on about four different people. But when the moment came, he accepted it himself. And what was moving to me in that moment was he brought it out to where that earned him the trust and credibility of so many others around him because he was willing to accept his responsibility for what went wrong and to own it and to change it. So think about this. Again, we often said that the Lessons in Leadership program is not simply about check off the box, here are the 10 things you need to know about leadership. It's really about life. Leadership and life are very much correlated. Sports and leadership correlated. 
here's my point. How often do we see presidents and governors and all kinds of people, including new heads of organizations, blame, talk about the opposite, the antithesis of everything you just described, the opposite of extreme ownership. How often do you hear people say, it was the previous president, it was the previous governor, it was the CEO before me, it was the person who headed up this department for me. Don't put it on me, look at what's been put in my lap. And then four years later, they're still talking about the other person. Is that the opposite of everything you just said? I believe it is. And actually what I was able to do is the lesson that came in this book about taking ownership brought me back to the day I graduated high school. Tell folks where you went because we talk about the influence that certain kinds of schools have had on us. Go uh, ahead. I went to Del Barton School in Morristown. As uh, is Catholic in Newark, doesn't exist anymore. Go ahead. But the priest, Father Giles Hayes, who's unfortunately passed recently, was the headmaster at the time. And in his graduation remarks, he spoke about pointing the finger at other people. And so he made the gesture where he pointed and he said, when you do that, if you flip your hand over, you have three pointing back at yourself. And as I've gone through life, anytime I've gotten into, we've all gotten into the heated moment where somebody will go the you, the minute that happens, I realize they're telling me about themselves. Almost each and every time they're telling me what their orientation is, what their disposition is, what point of view they may be coming from. They're trying to lay it off on somebody else. But it's really about them. Yes. Mary, jump in. I, mm -hmm. I, I see you fascinated. Well, right no, now. I'm laughing because one thing that Steve often does is instead of point, he often does this. So he makes sure to point all the... <laughs> <laughs> it, it may be subconsciously <laughs> something was straight. happening, but... Mary, right, Brian, listen you to see Greg that. Lalavie give this incredibly powerful, profound it, analysis it of point. Mm -hmm. And Mary says, Steve doesn't point. He goes like this. So what are you trying to say? <laughs> it deflects all... <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, but you do. I, and I noticed that. that out. Okay. I'm sure you do that because of rudeness. You don't want to be pointing at someone, but it's, yeah, it's But if I'm so... trying to have somebody in a seminar, I'll open my hand. Mm -hmm. But to Greg's point, if leaders don't constantly learn and evolve, mm -hmm. they don't they just die. stay the way mm -hmm. they are. They go backwards and they die. Go ahead. Yeah, they go backward, they die, not in the literal sense, but they do. We always talk about innovation and we talk about ways to renew and find new ways of doing things. And if you are too busy finger pointing, assigning blame, as Steve and I always talk, and it took us a long time to get here, we always talk about it's a lot easier to admit where you made a mistake, own it, and then literally go right into the next step of, all right, what are we going to do about it so it doesn't happen again? But that's really hard to do in leadership. And to that point, Greg, your people, they see you doing it. In my crazy mind, I'm convinced that because I've gotten better, at least in my mind, about blaming, because I was always quick to blame, very quick to blame. Things went wrong. If you ever read the introduction of my book, Lessons in Leadership, which is on our website, the whole first chapter is about me blaming people and not having control of my emotions. And Mary was like, look, I'm quitting. I'm getting out of here. And so is everybody else who's good. So you better change this. And it, I don't know how many years ago it was, but I really started to evolve. My problem is I think that because I'm owning it, then you better own it. And I get frustrated when some team members and others don't own it. You? Well, one of the things that I'm most grateful for in this project that I just alluded to a minute ago, a few of the staff were behind the deadline in getting it to me. And each of them picked up their phone and called me and apologized and accepted it, which just makes me believe in this topic of extreme ownership even more and that the leader can lead people into this. How about no excuses? How about the no excuses concept? Someone might say, and this is interesting, again, not just in leadership, but in life. Yeah, and it went wrong. I'll take that part of it. But what you don't understand is, and then there's a list of 15 things that they thought they were not in control of. Someone was unfair to them. The card was were stacked against them. You say? Well, you can't worry about what you can't control. You have to deal with what you can control. And then you have to focus on what you can control. So whatever might have been on that list of what somebody can't control, there has to be a way around that or to overcome that and put into a bucket of what could you control. Maybe it was traffic. Maybe you could have left earlier. There's always a, a solution. And that's part of the extreme ownership is about developing solutions, not focusing on what the problem may be, mm. but focusing on what the solutions might be. Switch gears a little bit. We're talking to Greg Lalavi, who is the business manager at the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825. They're a longtime friend of ours in the Lessons in Leadership family and also one of the big supporters of our work on public broadcasting. So I'm, I'm curious about this. You present in public a lot. 
and a lot of what we do, a lot of the leadership seminars we work with, your organization, is what we call executive presence, trying to have people present more, not in a statesman-like, or again, gender neutral, if you will, but the reality is to be more effective in the way they present. But so many folks are paranoid, afraid, I don't wanna do this, I can't, go back to that word, I can't do it. How have you evolved as a public communicator slash leader, and then how has that translated to your folks? Well, for myself, I work at it constantly. If I have to do any kind of a big presentation, I will go through it multiple times. I'll rehearse it out loud. Twice a year, I have to do a pretty lengthy, comprehensive report to my membership. You'll find me the Saturday and Sunday. It's usually a Monday meeting in my office at a podium, actually going through the entire thing because I want to make sure that you know, what one reads and what one speaks sometimes are two different things. So. Are you memor I'm curious about this because I'm not an advocate of memorizing, but it strikes me that part of you is memorizing. I'm not memorizing it, but by the time I get up at the podium on Monday, I've gone through it so many times that probably the first third of it is darn near committed to memory just because I've gone through. I, I don't stop and start. I will go through page one to the end. But I'm curious about this because I was actually saying to one of our clients yesterday, at another organization, a very prominent physician, he was preparing for a presentation and he knew it well. But I said to him, doctor, I'm not gonna say his name, I said, doctor, you actually have to own it. Going back to extreme ownerships, he said, what do you mean? I said, I know you know it, I know you've practiced it, but I'm not feeling it, you have to own this. And he goes, well, what does that look like? I said, I don't know, but I, it's like the, one of the justices in the Supreme Court, Justice Potter was asked, you know, how do you define pornography? You remember what he said? Actually, I don't. He said, I don't know, but I know it when I see it. And I said to the doctor, I know what owning it looks like, and I know, you know when you're not owning it. And so I kept saying to him, tell me why this matters to you. And he was so passionate, and he was so convicted. I said, tell me about an example when you saved a patient's life who came into the emergency room. He was all over it. And he goes, was well, that what you mean by owning it? And I said, yeah. I know you know it, but how do you own it? Well, you referenced before that I'm second generation operating engineer. My brothers are in this. So one of the things that you'll read in the book is one of the things that we need to do is believe in what you're talking about, believe in what you're doing. And I'll tell people all the time, when it comes to my life, when it comes to something simple as my medical benefits have come for 54 years by way of operating engineers local 825. So I believe in the goodness of the organization. I believe in what it stands for. It drives the passion that I have for it and the passion behind my work. There's one more piece I want to run past you. <laughs> Very often I run late, even though everybody else is on time. And my excuse, which is not okay, is that, oh, I was just in the gym, as if anybody cares, right? But here's the point I'm making. In my mind, working out and trying to take care of myself as best I can is part of being a strong leader and effective in life and being the healthiest person in life. You have gone through a fascinating metamorphosis, if I can say that correctly, a transformation from when to when, because if you Google some of our <laughs> previous interviews with Greg, let's just say this on steveadobato.org, check them out. You look a lot more fit today than you have in the past. Is that my imagination? No, from April 12th to today, I've lost 122 pounds. And it has been a transformation. And one of those things to talk about is actually a leadership lesson that I learned in a program that was authored by General George Casey, in which he talks about the anachronism of rest. And he says in a person's day, you have to find time to read, exercise, sleep, and think. What did that mean to you? Well, it meant to be an effective leader that I had to take care of myself. I'm not a big gym rat. I'm not an exercise lover, if you will. But you I don't have, have to be. No, but you have to carve out 10 to 15 minutes to take that walk. Do or you take to the do walk something now? positive. I, yeah. You build it in. Yes. You have to. You have to make the time. But you have to explain to folks how hard you've worked on the nutrition end. Because to me, that is a life and leadership lesson. Over time, this was happening. Because the other leadership lesson that's striking me, if I'm wrong, tell me, is the level of discipline required to do that. Am I wrong? No, not at all. It's a lot of discipline. And as you probably know, psychologists will tell you, you've got to make it through three weeks to develop a habit. So you try to dig your way through those first few weeks. And 
I found it to be true. Once I got through the first couple of weeks, my habits became just my habits. They weren't trying to do something overt or trying to stay in a quote unquote program. They just became my habits. But real quick on this, to what extent has it actually helped you as a leader? Being in better condition, losing 120 plus pounds, how has it even helped you? It's helped me tremendously. I feel as if I think more clearly. I think I present better outwardly. How about confidence level? Tremendously. Really? Um, my wife actually hit me with that this morning. She feels as if my confidence level has skyrocketed in the last couple of months. And I'm sure endurance too. Just getting out of bed and getting to work and working long days. Let's try this out for a second because Mary and I talk about when we talk about work-life integration, if you will, Mary's got the ridiculous schedule with two teenage boys. Her husband is so helpful as well. But the reality is, and when we, you and I talk about exercise, and by the way, she's dealing with a million other things and does an extraordinary job running two companies that we're involved in. Do you ever say to yourself, and I know I'm putting you on the spot, hey, I need to make some changes in that way? You and I have talked about that a really long time. I'm like you. I'm not a gym rat. I hate exercising. And I, I, I am not. It. I hate really? exercising. I hate it. I hate exercising and I hate getting massages, like going to like a spa and Two getting a massage. I love. Two things I know, which is really <laughs> fascinating. And I just find that not that it's a waste of time because at the end, you know, all right, this is going to better who I am. But I hate taking that time out from something else productive that I could be doing. I don't see it as productive. And same thing with massages. My head is racing through my to-do list. So, so I don't minute. exercise. I walk my dog. So that counts. So I want to get this straight. Once I won't believe this. You go to get a massage. They've got whatever aromas in the room and yep. smells and, you know, the, light the candles. The room's dark. It's yeah. And you're thinking about your list? My literal to-do list. Like, <laughs> when is this going to be over? When can I get in my car and go and be productive? Okay. Greg, let me ask you this. Before I let you go, I've asked you many times about the greatest leadership lesson or lessons you've learned, but I want to flip it. The greatest leadership challenge that you feel you face today, in spite of how much you've grown, there's no perfection. There's great leaders are constantly improving, right? And by the way, Greg is the greatest reader of leadership I've ever met, which is why our leadership library has changed in large part because of him. What would you say, by the way, now I pointed, I got nervous about that. <laughs> so what would you say your greatest challenge is as a leader today? Trying to set my organization up for the future. So the future is going to look completely different. And I'll reference another book that I read this summer called The Anticipatory Organization by Daniel Burris. And he talks about what he calls an exponential inflection point. And that is where forces combine that create exponential change and transformation. And underneath those things, he also identifies what he calls the digital disruptors, if you sure. will. But when you look at computing speed, when you look at bandwidth, when you look at digital storage, we only have to look at our cell phones to make this real. We went from analog signals to digital signals. We used to have a Palm Pilot that was separate from our phone. And as computing speed got better, as we went to digital signals, as we got more storage on the machine or in the cloud, we watched the rise of the cell phone and even future generations of cell phones as they've grown more pixels in the pictures because we've had more storage. But what does this have to do with well, leadership? Well, you have to prepare your organization for the future. And in my organization, we're watching computers and artificial intelligence and GPS control come into the machinery. And standing on the precipice of 5G being released broadly, this is going to change how fast signals can be done and how quickly you'll be able to displace people off of the machinery that we've been operating manually for 123 years. So devil's advocate, someone says, you know what? We're really losing jobs in this country because of automation, because of technology. What you are saying is maybe, maybe not. It's maybe not because you have to take every one of these things as an opportunity, not a setback. But it's a, a challenge. How's it an opportunity? Well, it's a challenge, but the opportunity is there's still going to be work to be done. Somebody's going to have to know how to set those computers up, how to interface with the robotics, how to deal with the mechanization. So there will be jobs there. The jobs will just be different than the ones as we know them today. How are you preparing folks for that? And let folks talk about innovation. Uh, Brian and his team at East Main Media built this studio in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. You folks have built a training facility, set it up for folks. Well, we've had a training facility for years, but on the You've back, taken to another level. We have. Uh, we're an accredited institute of higher learning now. 
which is the first step in our ambition to become a two-year technical college standalone on our own, which wow. we think will be done by the end of this year. Let me ask you, you talked about your dad was in, in the union. You think your dad ever envisioned, hey, we're going to have a college? No. But it's required. Yeah. Innovation is not an option, right? It's not an option at all. Change is the one constant in the world. So when Burris talks about his exponential inflection point for those who study language, those are some really powerful words. And when you talk about the speed at which the world is going to change now that the platforms are all digital. That's right. The world's always changed, but now that we're in a digital world where things are done 24 hours a day as the world spins, as we go to bed tonight, it's nine o'clock somewhere else on a digital platform. The world never sleeps. You know, we've said this many times, and, and I'll repeat it for our folks uh, watching and listening on lessons in leadership. By the way, you've been listening to Gray Lalavie from uh, Local 825, the International Union of Operating Engineers. This whole thing about innovate or die, you could be like, oh, Steve has another slogan. Not really. Because I've said this before. There are some organizations who are doing really well, who are making a lot of money. Folks on Wall Street making money off them. The shareholders making money. The employees doing well. But they didn't innovate. They didn't make the changes. They were too comfortable with the status quo. Dare I use some names. Kodak. Blockbuster. Research in motion. And you say, who are they? The parent company of BlackBerry. The list goes on of organizations, corporations doing well saying, we're good. We're standing pat. Status quo is fine. What's this whole thing about it? People are going to what? Want to watch movies in their home off of TV? People are going to want to take photos off their camera? That's ridiculous. We don't need to do that. Innovate or die, right? Well, the CEO of BlackBerry was infamous for saying nobody's ever going to want to watch videos on their phone. <laughs> <laughs> Just get on a bus or a subway that, one day and watch what well. everybody's doing. Could you yeah, imagine? Yeah, that worked well. Mary, final words before we let Greg go, because I, I watch I watch Mary Gamba watching and listening to our fascinating guests on Lessons in Leadership, and I find that you are fascinated. I am. I absorb everything like a sponge, and I will use the example of if you're pointing and you have the three fingers coming your way. It's Thank a you. great. I know. It's a great example. <laughs> it's an absolute great example. But and I innovation. may be the first student in your college, too, because as I said, we, we had Greg on before uh, for our radio, just the radio show. Right. And I am dying to use one of those big machines and go digging. You're so. welcome anytime. Yeah, hey, you no, know, I'm so going to take you up on that. Yeah, Mary's gonna, yeah, just don't let her leave my organization. We'll <laughs> die. Innovate or die? Without Mary Gamble, you die. But how about this one? It's so fascinating. As we let Greg go, Mary has worked with Greg for several years now. They've had countless conversations on the phone, email, text messages constantly. He walks in the studio here at East Main Media, and she goes, it's so good to meet you for the first time. Mm -hmm. How crazy is that, that our interpersonal face-to-face -face is less, but we interact with people all the time. Welcome to the digital divide. Exactly. This has been Greg Lalavie. I'm Steve Adubato. That's Mary Gamba. We are at East Main Media Studios. Lessons in Leadership come back right after this. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. This edition of the Steve Adubato Leadership Hour has been made possible by New Jersey Resources. Welcome back to Lessons in Leadership. I'm Steve Adubato with my colleague, Mary Gamba. Mary, I know I, you thought I was going crazy when I was talking mm -hmm. about disruption because Greg Lalavie from Local 825 was talking about, he used the term, but I want to make it clear. Again, books are not props, they're real. A book by Terry Jones, a, a colleague and friend who I recently had a chance to interview on a conference down in Baltimore. His book is called Disruption, the technological disruption coming for your company and what the heck you need to do about it. I added heck, that's not in there. Yeah, here's well, the that's thing. one I haven't read. You have to give us a little bit more information. I don't think well, that's mainstream. Well, here's what it is, right out of the box. We'll talk about disruption. And mm -hmm. This is from a quote that he uses from Mike Campbell in The, uh, the Sun Also Rises. Ready? Question. So how did you go bankrupt? Two ways. Gradually and then suddenly. Wow. What does that that's mean That's powerful. You? Yeah. What that means to me is that sometimes you may think that something is way down the line, that maybe whether it's a job or, I mean, this is obviously they're talking about something unfortunate, but it seems like you don't realize how close it is until it happens. And so Disruption. therefore, mm -hmm. the whole concept, I think people think we may be beating a dead horse, innovate or die. It's not just some slogan. The fact is, we talked about the companies before, and that's just Google Organizations that died because they didn't innovate, whether it's BlackBerry, mm -hmm. whether it's Blockbuster, whether it's Kodak, it's a long, long list. And the reality is, 
I was watching a movie about Steve Jobs the mm -hmm. other day, the movie that was out a few years ago. Fascinating. The quote from Steve Jobs, read it for mm -hmm. us. Absolutely. Innovation distinguishes between a leader and a follower. What does that mean to you? In order to innovate, you need somebody to lead that innovation. Innovation means change, and innovation is a new buzzword, and rightfully so, because especially with everything changing, we've got digital, we've got TV, everything is right there computers, we've got our phones where you can log we've got on. Artificial and intelligence. We did a mm -hmm. whole public broadcasting special on voice technology with our colleagues at the New at Jersey NJIT. Institute of Technology. Absolutely. On voice. Yeah, absolutely. Amazon Alexa. You could speak in your house. I'll walk in my house and I'll say, you know, Alexa, turn on my lights. Alexa, play country music. Alexa, do this, do that. And she just does it. You don't even have to think. You don't have to lift a finger. And it's fascinating. It's scary because you always wonder who's listening to you when. But once you get past that, it's a matter of just knowing that these are the times are changing. But, but think about this. It's not just that the times are changing. Mm -hmm. Is that the connection to, you may ask, what's the connection in leadership? Mm -hmm. It's that Steve Jobs, even though he had a terrible personality and was awfully mean to people and would embarrass them in public, but the other side of him was he saw things that others couldn't even imagine. And his biggest challenge, as I had thought about it, was he was trying to explain what he saw. And they didn't see what he saw and were turned off and afraid. And we're wondering, why can't we just stay where we are right now? And he's like, no, we have to move forward. And by the way, he often failed. Right. So talk about the idea of failure and innovation. Well, before we get to failure, just when you were talking about one of the keys to leadership is being persuasive, being able to persuade others when they didn't even see that it was possible. So, Or they know, don't think it is. Or they don't think it is. They didn't see it that way. Or worse, they may think something totally different. And then you may have to really switch and negotiate and go back and forth and change their mind. But with failure, one of the reasons innovation will stall or just not happen at all is because people are fearful of failing. And that's just unfortunate because if he was afraid to say, wow, let us take the iPhone, it was great. I mean, the original iPhone and now we're up to like the 10, 11, I don't yep, even yep. know. And every time it's like, oh, wait, we're not going to have one camera on this iPhone. We're going to put three cameras. Well, excuse me. That doesn't mean we think that every innovation as mm -hmm. a leader like it's a great innovation. Right. Sometimes you ask why they even do exactly. this. It doesn't sometimes, make sense, but go ahead. I think sometimes it's Don't innovate just to, for the point of innovation. And sometimes, and again, I mean, I love my iPhone. I love Apple products. And sometimes I think, wow, they just changed the phone. So this way more people go out and buy it, right? And the same with anything, whether you're talking about electric cars. Innovation is really finding a new way to do things that will hopefully leave the world a better place. And that's what I feel innovation is all about. Quick follow up on this. What about the fact, and we have talked about this countless times, first time on video, it is very difficult to communicate to people around you that innovation is necessary, A, and B, that they need to be a part of it. This innovation, I know we keep talking about this, the innovation of doing this, changing from what we're doing every day. You hire a producer who comes in, he or she comes in, they're going to produce a show, Steve's going to host the show, and we're going to put it on PBS and other outlets, and that's what we do. Okay, that's a lot of what we do. But we're going to create this podcast, we're going to create this radio show, we're going to put it on video, and Mary, I'd like you to be the co-host because you and I talk leadership all the time. Your first instinct wasn't, oh, great, I'm all in, was it? No, I, I mean, my first reaction was, number one, I'm not a host, number two, I'm not a producer. I know what I know, and this was something that was on familiar territory, but being an I'm innovator, sorry. all right, so for those listening on the radio, Steve is holding up one of his props, and it says, life begins at the end of your comfort zone. But You weren't comfortable doing this out of the box. No, no, not A year not later, how are you feeling? I'm very comfortable. So what's the point yeah. here? Well, the point is what we've been nailing in this entire time, which is that you can get out of your comfort zone, and it will be okay. Fear is natural, but it's what you do with that fear and how you channel it, which is really going to make the difference between true leaders and those who are super successful and those that kind of just toe the line and they're just going to plateau. And that's and, okay. And to that point, there are some folks that we know on our team, and I have no problem saying this, that I've said I'd like you to come on and I'd like you to be, have a conversation with us. And I know what they're really thinking is, you didn't hire me to do that. Mm -hmm. I got hired to do this because they look at the job description and my response will be, but we're evolving, we're changing. I need you to do this and I see something in you that allows me to say that you'd be a great addition. No, nope, it's not what I do. I'm uncomfortable doing it. The question for a leader is, and I've said, asked you this countless times, how hard do you push? 
in certain cases, when using this as an example, using this story, I think there are certain people who it's not just are. Not us. For no, everybody no, no. Listening, but I'm saying, if someone right is, now. if someone really puts their foot down and says, "Listen, that's really not for me," but then what you would like to hear is, "However, let me just give you another place where I feel like I can be helpful." That would be a that's good the way. Leader's job. No, no, no. I'm thinking that would be if that were me. If you said to me, "Mary, I want you to help me with this radio show," if you get yourself out of that comfort zone and you try it, it was never in my job description, and we are just in the process of hiring a new team member. And the one thing that I said to every single person that we interviewed for this position was, we need you to not be wet to this job description. Sure, here it is. Here's a piece of paper. Here are the types of responsibilities we anticipate you doing. A year from now, if you're still doing this, we have a problem and you need to be adaptable. And then I asked them to share an example where they're flexible and they're willing to try different things. Because sure. if not, it's just not going to be a good fit for ours or any organization. So interesting. Because Mary and I do disagree about this because I'm a big believer in pushing people harder than I think Mary sometimes thinks I should. To me, one of the signs of a really good leader, and trust me, I'm not saying I'm a great leader. I'm saying I'm a leader who learns every day, hopefully, that sometimes really good leaders see things in people that they don't see in themselves, even if that other person's saying that's not me. Easier said than done, I know. But that is one of the great things about lessons in leadership, that we challenge ourselves. By the way, as we let people go, Mary, let's thank East Made Media Studio for making this possible. Everyone listening on AM 970, on our podcast, and on the video side as well. Folks can find us where? Absolutely. They can find us on our website, stand-deliver.com. And also, they can uh, follow you on Facebook and on Twitter, Steve Adubato, PhD. And that's spelled A-D-U-B-A-T-O. How great is our uh, website at stand-deliver.com? What can people get? There? A lot of free stuff. We've got articles on every topic involving Did you leadership. you say free stuff? Free stuff. And we also have links for your five books. Lessons in Leadership is your most recent. We are working on a new one, soon to be titled. Just to clarify, the books aren't free. No, okay, the books are not Steve free. Okay, Steve Adubato, Mary Gamba, this has been Lessons in Leadership. You see the logo there. We'll check you next time. This is Mary Gamba. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with State of Affairs with Steve Adubato, where we look at the most pressing issues facing the state of New Jersey. This edition of the Steve Adubato Leadership Hour has been made possible by New Jersey Resources. Hi, I'm Patrick Dunnikin. At Gibbons, we believe that citizens need to be informed about the complex issues that affect their lives. That's why we're proud to support the programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of State of Affairs with Steve Adubato has been provided by the law firm of Gibbons PC, RWJ Barnabas Health, NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, PSENG, committed to providing safe, reliable energy now and in the future. And by Keystone Mountain Lakes Regional Council of Carpenters. Your future is in our building. Promotional support provided by Insider NJ. And by NJ Advance Media. Welcome to State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato. We're coming to you from the Agnes Varis NJ TV studio in Newark. We're pleased to once again welcome the Senate President in the great state of New Jersey, Senator Steve Sweeney. Good to see you, Senator. It's good to see you, Steve. Um, let's jump right into this. Path to Progress is a report that has been researched, submitted, and now says, what are the keys to fiscal health in New Jersey? Well, look, it, there's several. But you started this whole thing. Well, yeah, I just asked a bunch of experts. The, basically, the, uh, the best New Jersey has. Not partisan in any way at all, just experts. How do we fix what's wrong? And they came up with... You know, 200 recommendations, we whittled it down to, I, th I think it's 36 or 27. I, I forget the number now. It's been a little while. But it's, it's hitting at the things that we all know need to be done, but they're the hard things. Top of the list. Pension reform, health care reform, school consolidation, things that we've talked about for years that is now to a point, these are the big things that have to get done in order to save billions of dollars for taxpayers. Because New Jersey's biggest problem is cost. And without addressing the problems, we're never going to, we're just going to just keep pouring money in it. And looking for new taxes to raise 
without fixing the structural problems doesn't work. By the way, uh, by the way, if you listen to us on the audio side, Senator Steve Sweeney, Senator President Steve Sweeney is with us on State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato. Question is this. New Jersey's fiscal health, one of the issues that you and the governor disagree on is that he believes strongly that in order to strengthen the fiscal health of the state, we need to, in fact, increase taxes on those who earn the most money. After a million dollars, every dollar is taxed more. He says if we don't do that, we're not going to have money for a lot of the programs that people want. He's wrong because those are the people that can leave, and after the federal salt, you know, the State and local Trump, tax deduction with President Trump, what? the federal law? Yes. Cap at 10 grand, that's it? Yeah. State income tax, property taxes, more than that, you're on your own. Exactly. Can't write it off. Go ahead. So now you have a population that's just got hit with another tax because people didn't mind paying them as much because they wrote them off. Now they can't. And my point is, if you want to talk about revenue raisers, fix the structural problems first, then you'll know what you need, and then if you have to talk about taxes, then talk about them. But without fixing what's wrong in New Jersey, and this is where I am really frustrated with a governor that wrote a report when Dick Cody was the governor. Let's make it clear, uh, Senator Dick Cody, then acting governor, had Dick Cody, he had a commission that looked at the pension situation, and Murf Governor Murphy at the time, private citizen, did what? He chaired it and wrote the report that said we need a dramatic change, that this wasn't sustainable. That was back in over. You're talking about the pension and health care yeah. situation with public Steve, employees. Steve, back then the deficit was $11 billion. Today, the pension deficit's over $100 billion, about $150, and $115. And our health care, retiree health care deficit, is over, over $100 billion. So now we're about $220 billion, billion, not million, in the hole. So you can't raise taxes enough to fill that hole. When does the bill come due? The bill's coming due now. And if we don't fix the pension soon, if we don't fix the pension soon, by 2023, you're going to have a $4 billion deficit in New Jersey. In the budget? Yeah, without a reset, without a recession. So if I give you the millionaire's tax, right? If I give you the millionaire's tax. What does tax, it bring in? It's inflated, the number they use, but I'll give it to them, $536 million. And increase revenue to the state. Go ahead. If no one leaves. So, okay, I'll give it to them, 536. What about the other, what about the, the other two and a half billion? Steve, we can't raise taxes to get us out of this. We need to make structural reforms. Listen, I want to make sure teachers have good pensions. Same with all public employees. But other states, 12 other states in this country, have changed their pension structure. Well, we have to, respectfully, Senate President Steve Sweeney with us on State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato. A few years ago, didn't you, together with Republican Governor Chris Christie, work on this, and there was pension reform? It wasn't enough, though, Steve. That's the problem. We did what we could get done, because these are big things. Like I said, these are things you talk about forever, and it's very rare you do. If we don't do this, Oregon just did it. Portland, uh, Portland Oregon, just, I mean the state of Oregon, just changed their pension system. Democrat governor. Democrat uh, legislature, both what do you houses. Mean change? Be specific. Well, like what? Be they, specific as to what needs to be done. In 2003, they went to a hybrid system, which was so much like the first 40,000, this is what we're proposing, is a pension. Anything above that is basically annuity. Like, you know, we're going to take a percentage of your income, put it in annuity, invest it. That's what Oregon has. Isn't that risky with the stock market being no, so volatile? because no, when you do, listen, when you're doing, if, if it's, I won't call it a 401k. I'm calling it an annuity. Some do, but go ahead. But I won't for one reason, because there's no match. So if you're doing it, that's what the other states do. But you don't put it in high risk. You know, I deal with annuities all the time. In your work? In, in As your, an iron worker. Yes. And who represents, who deals with the union very directly. And I, we all have annuities to supplement the pensions. But this way, you start to change, Steve. You start to move the, the process. If we do it today, 30 years from now, it'll be fixed. But if we don't do it, in Oregon, when they did it, mm. their pension funding dropped from 90% to 80%. And the, and, the, and the governor and the legislature made changes to it again, legislatively. We're in, like, the high 30s. We're almost bankrupt, and people don't realize you it. You use that word sometimes, and I... I, I is that the right word, or yes. is that hyperbole an no. exaggeration? It's not an exaggeration. If we continue the course we're going, we're going to be bankrupt. And here's the bigger problem. We can't fund anything, Steve. Everything has to go to pension and health care now. Everything. You know, when you look at this budget, 
you know, we're squeezing pennies here and there to do additional things. If the pension system had not been played with, starting with the Whitman administration, the pension payment would have been $800 million. When you say played with, either not, yeah, not put money into or taking money out, go ahead. Bonding, and then government's not funding. Right. And, but, but look, there was a little secret to that one. I shouldn't say taking money out. It wasn't taken out. But it was bonded. They bonded, bonded the pension. But what else they did, Steve, what else they did was there was a wink and a nod when the pension payments weren't being made. I was there. I watched it. And I was like, what are you guys going to do with what your pension? They, what they think was going to happen when the bill came due? Well, the problem is they weren't going to be there. The people that made so, these decisions, are, the, the people <sighs> that are here today yes. are not the ones that made the decisions. So I don't blame you them. But you have to, you and, and the governor and the other legislators down, other state leaders, it's your job to, quote, deal with it. That's where we are. So let me ask you, say it doesn't happen. What does it mean for the average citizen of New Jersey, not a policymaker, not an insider, not somebody who follows what's going on in the state capitol every day? What would it mean to their lives? They're going to have to find ways to raise taxes, whether it's increased sales taxes. Look, if the pension system goes broke and we have to start paying out $6 billion a year, a year, and we're not far from that, you know, uh, there's, there's zones like a green, yellow, and red when you're in trouble with pensions. We're in the 30s, high 30s, and it keeps dropping as we keep putting more money into it. Mm. So, Steve, it's one of these things that it's not working. No matter how much money we, we will continue to fund our full obligation, knowing a recession's coming. What, say a recession's coming. Could it mean, Senator President Sweeney, that fewer dollars, state dollars to public schools in your community? Could it mean that? Absolutely. Could it mean fewer dollars for women's health care services? All across the board. Fewer dollars for infrastructure projects. Well, now we dedicated you got the transportation the trust fund. Yeah, but, but how about higher education, fund. where we have the second most expensive so higher education cuts there. system? Oh yeah, everyone's going to have to take a cut because there's no funding for anything. By the way, real quick, switch gears on this. It's a fiscal issue as well. You and the governor appear to be at loggerheads on this. There are several institutions of higher learning, some of whom we collaborate with, and other entities. Cancer funding in one of the um, initiatives. Where, where is that? I think it's ten million dollars. That they froze in Camden. Okay, make 100%. that clear. Okay, so there, there's two hundred and thirty some odd million dollars yeah. frozen from what the legislature wanted to pass in the budget, and the governor said, "No, we're not doing that." And how much is that? It's policy driven. There's a question here. Trust me. How much of it is policy driven, and just the fact that the two of you often don't get along? It was politics, Steve. You know why you know it was politics? Because eighty percent of what he froze is what he put in the budget. When he attacked the legislature saying we filled the budget with pork, right? And he said, I'm pork repeating. Pork meaning projects that are just for your budget. district? Go yeah. ahead. And he said it. Well, then freeze those projects. If, if you're feeling they're not worthy, freeze them. But you froze 80% of the projects that were meant to help people. Why okay. is all the cancer funding frozen, all of it, in southern New Jersey, but they you think it was Northern. targeted to Southern New Jersey? Well, listen, Partly because you're there? No, no, no. There, there's th things in Essex County yeah, that were are. targeted. There's a zoo I know of, there, uh, there Turtleback were, Zoo. There's right. things in Essex, there's things in Central, but they were targeted for anybody that resisted and disagreed. And, and unfortunately, Steve, look, okay. this gets personal for me. I lost my mother and my, my brother to cancer. Why would you deny people in Southern New Jersey dollars to deal with cancer treatment? It's offensive. And it's unfair. You know, I went after Chris Christie when he cut a budget one time and called him a whole bunch of bad names. I don't know what to say when Phil Murphy says, well, I support these things. Well, then fund them. Because, by the way, they can't answer one question, not one question, how they came up with a list, and what they tell of you. Of what they weren't going to fund. Yeah. You know what they say? The executive order speaks for itself. I said, no. Well, tell me who was in a room and who made the decisions, and why this was funded and this wasn't funded. And why would you freeze 80% of your own funding? Stay on that, Senator. I want to make something clear. Senator President Steve Sweeney with us here, Steve Adubati here at the studios of NJTV for State of Affairs. You may be asking yourself, what does the governor have to say about this? And I want to be really clear about this. We have and will continue to work with the governor's office to try to get him in this studio for a State of Affairs State of Affairs interview, so that he can offer his perspective on this. I want to make it clear, we've tried. It's been a scheduling issue to date. We will get that done. That being said. I, I would love to see him. Okay, can we do this? Sure. Quick, you've called for a ban on vaping. Yes. 30 seconds, why? Because it's an epidemic right now, and, and you know, 
these vaping stores are actually using products that are illegal products out of, you know, they talk about the corner, Steve. They're getting them out of China. They're getting into the, in the stream, and people are getting sick. It's, it's not like, it's, not, it's, it's, it's worse than cigarettes, because cigarettes is a, is a chronic effect. It takes a long time. This is an acute effect where you vape one night, and the next day you're in the hospital. You believe this ban is possible? Yes. There's support for it? Yes. Governor Murphy communicated that he would be supportive? He didn't communicate he wouldn't, and he called for everyone to stop banning immediately. You saw Not to stop banning, to ban immediately. To, to stop vaping immediately. Okay. And you know, Governor Cuomo just came out yes. with an announcement. And President and, Trump has said some things on this. God, it scares me. But, but, but he said but, something but similar. he's right. He's right on this. I can't believe I'm agreeing with him, but he's on right this. on this. Yes. Do this one. Marijuana. Yeah. How far away are we from the legalization of cannabis slash marijuana in the state of New Jersey? The governor uh, wants it. I want it, so does the speaker. Speaker uh, Craig Coughlin wants it. So what stands in the way? Uh, some of my members. And we're going to push in lame duck to get it done. If not, we'll put lame it Lame duck meaning after the November after election the up November until election. January the new legislature takes January, over. January, whatever, mid-January. And if, and if not, we'll prepare a ballot initiative that we know will be successful. Okay, real quick, uh, uh, I've talked about this before. We have an initiative called Right from the Start NJ, focusing on child care for infants and toddlers, improving that situation. It's just been $54 million of state money going to that. What more do we need to do? Well, you know, Steve, we need to fund more, to be perfectly honest with you. And, like, Tressa Ruiz, Senator Ruiz and myself, yes. she, she's a champion for pre-K, you know, right? She sure has. She has a small child as well, very focused we on this. Need, we need to get to birth. We need to get children at birth. My daughter was a, was a preemie. She has Down syndrome. She was in early intervention. The earlier you get someone, the more they learn. Your brain, 85% of your brain develops from birth to five years old. So we should be looking at putting as much money in as we can early, because it's, it's that old Fram commercial, pay me now, pay me later. Got to pay either way. You, you make that investment up front. Um, Senate President Steve Sweeney, thank you for joining us. And I'm glad that you're here uh, in the next few seconds as we acknowledge that State Senator Tony Bucco, who served in the legislature for many years, uh, 81 years of age, joined us many times on State of Affairs. A gentleman, a class act, someone who always would disagree without being disagreeable. And we lost him. The state has lost him, an important public servant. And I just want to acknowledge that on behalf of everyone here at State of Affairs, NJTV, the public television family, that we wish um, the Bucco family all the best. Rest in peace, Tony Bucco. He, he, the way he described him is exactly how he, how he was. He's a gentleman, a class act. You couldn't find a bad word to say about him. Steve, the thing that's uh, it's really sad is I really consider him a very good friend, and I'm heartbroken that he passed. Uh, you know, he's had some tough times recently, but I thought he was getting beyond him. And, and I, you know, he was a tough guy, too. Mm. He stood his ground, but get, he stood, stood his ground. But one thing you knew, when Tony Bucco gave you his word, it was gold. Thank you, Senator. Thanks, sir. This is State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato. We'll be right back. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are honored to be joined by the mayor of the great city of New York, Ross Baraka. Good to see you, Mayor. Good to be here. Um, the issue that we need to talk about, that everyone's talking about, is the Newark public, excuse me, Newark water situation. As succinctly as possible, what is the problem and how did it get to be where it is? Well, the city of Newark has uh, older homes that have uh, service lines that bring water into their home that are made out of lead. Uh, the service lines actually owned by the homeowner. Uh, they have to be removed. Uh, they've been there for centuries. Um, you know, maybe 25, 30 years ago, the, st the city began putting uh, corrosion control in the water to stop the lead from coming from the pipes and getting into the water. It began to fail somewhere around 2017 uh, or so it began to fail. And so when we got proof that it was absolutely failing... Proof by whom? The EPA, Environmental Protection Agency. So the federal government directly involved? Yes. So we do all the testing. So it's this characterization that people come and test our water. We do all the testing. City does. City. 
and then we report what we find. So we reported high levels of lead. Uh, we couldn't explain why we were getting high levels of lead in the beginning, so we cut a pipe out of the ground and sent it to the EPA. The EPA uh, scientists looked at it and told us that the corrosion control was failing hmm. uh, and that we had to get a new corrosion control. In 17? Uh, they told us in 2018 that it was failing. So where do the filters come in? Sorry for jumping. 2018. We started giving out Explain filters. Explain the water filters. They're not, they're not city water filters. They're put out by a manufacturer. Right. They're by Pure uh, Water Company, uh, Pure Filter Company, excuse me, who uh, manufactures filters for people all over the country, the world for that matter. People use them everywhere. Uh, they're NSF certified. They were approved by the EPA. Uh, we put, we put 39,000 of them in our of them out. We started in October 2018. Uh, we did three tests and found two of them were not working to the capacity that we thought they should work Mayor, to. Mayor, sorry for interrupting. Why only three? Because that number confused me and I'm sure a lot of yeah. other people. Because it wasn't, it wasn't a, a formal kind of test, right, to test filters. What we were actually testing was the new orthophosphate that we were actually putting in the water, right? So we were testing that uh, to come in one end and come out the other end. So we tested a home in the north water, one in the south, and one in the West to test to see if the new chemical was actually getting through the pipe. And two of three said what? Uh, so they, they reduced lead, but not below 15 parts per billion, or not below Yeah, lead. try to explain that one. Right, well, <laughs> the, lead the and copper rule says that you right. can only have up to 15 parts per billion of lead in your water. Uh, it did not reduce it below that, so in our mind, they failed. One of them actually did. We tested, uh, since then, two, 225 filters, six times a piece, uh, you know, with a whole, you know, kind of uh, group of people who tested it, a whole protocol. And so we have, we should have those results back. Uh, but as we do this program, do not have them. Well, actually, uh, they do have them, and they're working on uh, the findings of it. I'm very optimistic of, of what it's going to say. But, um, you know, they're, they're looking at the findings of it now. We'll be able to uh, say something to the public by the end of this week or the beginning of next. Long-term fix, the uh, County of Essex, the County Executive, Joe DiVincenzo, you can check out an NJTV news story on this together with the mayor and Governor Murphy. There was a press conference. Um, the county came in and helped you bond for $120 million. Yes. To do what and how is that paid? To pull the lead service lines out of people's homes. Uh, you know, a while ago, we actually had to get the law changed on the state level to allow the city to be able to do that. That was, you know, most people don't know about that because we're using public money to fix people's private homes. So we, we were allowed to do that, so we began doing that. We've changed maybe 900 lead service lines already uh, outside of the county's money. And that would have took, taken us about eight years to complete if, now? Now, if we would have continued the way we were doing and it. And with this bonding with Essex County? About 24 to 30 months tops. It'll, what it'll will happen us. in 24 to 30 months? Make it clear Every 18,000 lead service lines in the city of Newark, Belleville, and Hillside will change all their lead service. The mayor mentions Belleville and Hillside because, if I'm not mistaken, the water in those communities, as well as the water in Newark, comes from? The WANAQ system. Excuse me, the Pequonic system. Not the WANAQ system. Not the WANAQ, the Pequonic system. The Pequonic system. system. Yeah, the Pequonic uh, system. Help us on this, mayor. This is not, this is also not easy because there are certain homeowners, don't they, I don't want to call it eminent domain, but aren't there certain issues as to whether homeowners will allow you in or not to do these things? Uh, yeah, they, we do have to get their permission. We uh, <clears throat> have introduced a law to the city council that would allow us to go on people's property through home rule and uh, change their pipes, uh, even if, if we can't get in touch with them, if they're being too difficult, or things of that. What about 70% of the uh, folks in the city living in rental properties? What well, about those landlords? Well, that, that law will help us go onto their property and change those pipes. So, Mayor, to those who have been critical, both in the media and community groups. There's also uh, the Natural Resources Defense Council. Right. Um, you laugh as I say it. They're bringing a lawsuit against the city. Yeah. For those who have argued, you know what? The city hasn't been as transparent as it should be. The mayor hasn't been as transparent as he needs to be on this in terms of when this happened, when they knew about it, and what the danger was. You say? I say that's incorrect, and it's, uh, people are uh, creating information that's just not true. Every, every time that people know we have lead in the water is because we did it. We told them. We did the test. 2016, when it was lead in the schools, we reported that, which changed the state's uh, testing system around the entire state. 2017, we reported it. 2018, we reported it. We keep reporting it. We reported the filters are not working. We did that. But Mayor, um, real quick, well, uh, you had said at a certain point, quote, the, the water is absolutely safe to drink. Now, this problem is not a new one. It's about two and a half years that you've known about this. 
When you said this water is, quote, absolutely safe to drink. D did you read the whole thing? Go ahead, put it in context. Right, because what, what, what people have been doing, led by NRDC, has been putting that, that up that there. That group that the National yeah. Resources Defense Council, I'm sorry. Put this thing up there, Newark, the water is safe to drink, right? When you, when you keep reading that, it says, unless you have an older home or a lead service line. That's what it says. That's the rest of the quote. That's the rest of the quote. If you have a lead service line, or if you live in an older home, you have a problem. It says that on the robocalls. Now, we can, we can argue or quibble about the, if we think that that is, uh, you know, effective, right, or, or if, if it causes confusion, well, but to say we misled people a lot is just not true. Well, let, there's intent and then there's execution. Right. If, in golf, um, we call it a mulligan. Right, 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 Would right. you have said it differently, given how easy that is to take out a yeah, country? absolutely. I mean, it's, it's confusion, right? So it, it, people have made it cause further confusion by just le reading the, the byline, which is like when you read any paper. The paper says, uh, lead is downtown Newark. And then you go further on and read it, and you find out one building had a test that was incorrect. Or the people in Elizabeth don't want Newark's water right. based on this. And then you find but out it's not But if you're looking true. at yourself, you yeah. say to yourself, you know what? This is, there was a better way to say that. I wish I hadn't made that quote. I'm not putting words in your mouth. I'm just asking you in yeah. learning from this. Sure, there's always a better way to, uh, to say it. I think that uh, because of the confusion that, that it is causing, you know, but to characterize it as uh, us misleading or lying is just not true. Is there a trust-related issue here now, too? In the absolutely. eyes of Sun? Sure, absolutely. And you, and you do what today? I'm a student of leadership. You are a leader. You say what? This is a challenge of regaining the trust of some. You do what now? Well, we continue to solve the problem. And that's what I've been trying to do from the very beginning. That's all we're going to do. We're going to solve the problem. Uh, we're going to move every lead service line out of the city of Newark and surrounding cities, for that matter, that, that uh, you know, access our water, that have lead service lines. We're going to remove them. Even, even when we put responsibility. This Why isn't it Bloomfield and these other communities that are it's actually the, from the It's same actually place. the homeowner's responsibility. It's, it's, it's actually the homeowner's responsibility, not the municipalities, because the, the lead service line belongs to the homeowner. But we're taking responsibility for it because we know it's too costly for homeowners to Of course, to they remove. can't afford that. Right, they can't afford it. So the city is taking responsibility for it. We are raising the money for it with the help of uh, the Joe D. and Essex County. By the way, how that, that loan, uh, $120 million loan, paid off how and by whom? Well, the city has to pay it off over a 30-year period. Does that mean taxpayers? Well, no. We... Initially, it will be, like generally, it would be taxpayers uh, if we did not have another... Like a thousand bucks per citizen, if I'm not mistaken. If we didn't know how to have another source of funding. But we do. We have other sources of funding that would allow us to pay the debt service without raising taxes. You're confident 24 to 30 months from now, Mayor, we will be having a very different conversation about water in the city? Sure. Maybe sooner. And uh, we're doing this even after we put the new orthophosphate, the new corrosion control in the water. So we anticipate that lead levels will begin dropping by the end of the year. Before uh, let's out here, anyone who says Flint, Newark in the same sentence, you say? I say Flint changed their water source on purpose. They didn't put corrosion control in the water because it was too costly. Ours failed. We were always in compliance with the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. Flint was not in compliance with the EPA and, or the, or the uh, DEP, and so Newark was. Mayor Roz Baraka of uh, Brick City, Newark, New Jersey. I want to thank you for joining us and uh, me, sharing man. your perspective on this. All the best. They're right there. My this friend. has been State of Affairs. Um, we want to continue the conversation, so uh, follow me on Twitter, at Steve Adubato. Make sure we see you next time. Thank you, Mayor. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 30 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of State of Affairs with Steve Adubato has been provided by the law firm of Gibbons PC, RWJ Barnabas Health, NJIT, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, PSENG, Keystone Mountain Lakes Regional Council of Carpenters, and by these public-spirited organizations, individuals, and associations committed to informing New Jersey citizens about the important issues facing the Garden State and by Employers Association of New Jersey. Promotional support provided by Insider NJ and by NJ Advance Media. PSENG is building New Jersey's clean energy future. We're working to protect our network against extreme weather, expanding and upgrading transmission lines, 
and modernizing our natural gas system by installing new, more durable underground pipes. At PSE&G, our goal is to make sure you have the safe, reliable energy you need to power your life now and into the future.